Oh, hi everybody. I'm so excited to see you. I'm assuming you're here, probably because you're in the process of finding your remote job of your dreams. Or maybe you're just thinking about it. Maybe you're already interviewing. Either way, most likely you're here to get a little bit of tips, some insight, some motivation on the best ways to get that job. And you're in the right place. I am incredibly excited to have you. If you've forgotten, my name is Shannon. Shani does everything on TikTok. Shani does everything on Instagram and YouTube. And I'm here sharing every bit of knowledge that I have about getting remote jobs. And the knowledge that I don't have, I'm outsourcing. I've got a lot of fantastic contacts in my network and I am pulling them in to have them be a part of this. Why? Because I want you to have that job that you want. I want you to have the freedom to pick up your kids after school every day. I want you to have the freedom to have your cup of coffee while you're doing your makeup, listening to music, watching your favorite episode of The Bachelor, whatever. I want you to be able to jump up in the middle, of, like during lunch, go to your kitchen, heat up some leftovers from last night, sit down with your husband or wife or partner and, and have lunch. I want to give you that freedom. And this is an opportunity that I did not have. I had to figure out the hard way how to get a job and I was so confused. I remember how long it took me to figure out which ones were legitimate and which ones were, were garbage spam postings. And I went through a lot yeah. and I applied to a lot yeah. of jobs. And then I found it. And then that job snowballed into another job, into another job, and into my dream job. Uh, I continued to be promoted because I worked my ass off. Um, but step one is step one. Step one is getting you into that first remote job. Because once you're in there, it's just up. So for today's episode, I've got something really special and exciting. I have brought in a, a very experienced remote recruiter. This is the type of person that gets hundreds of applications and goes through them. Um, so she knows the tricks of what stands out. What is a resume no-no? What is something that you should have in your resume and you probably don't? And so this is just a conversation between her and I where I ask her all the questions that I've been asked by you. That way I can make sure to get to the bottom of each of the issues and dig a little deeper. So now you have some guidance on where to go with your resume to make it perfect. In this video, we're definitely gonna cover um, what's a bit of non-traditional information that she suggests to include on your resume. I like that one because we've all been taught the standard way to do your resume, right? We're gonna talk about the new way. Um, another, another topic we'll discuss is um, what sections of your resume do remote recruiters generally spend the most time reviewing? Which ones do they not look at at all? Um, and so which ones do you need to highlight and make sure is like really up to snuff? What does a bad resume look like? What does a good resume look like? And then this one's interesting. We'll talk about what's a personality trait that they look for and that they can see through your resume. Um, something that you put on your resume that they're like, oh, I know that they are this type of person because they did this. And then the importance of quantifiable skills, numbers. If you're in sales, that would be, you don't want to say, I continuously met quota every quarter. What does that mean? What kind of accounts did you work with? Um, if you're customer service, for example, and you don't have quantifiable numbers, um, you can share reviews. That's what I did. Um, I took screenshots of every amazing review that someone had left about me that called me by name and I put them in a Google Doc and I sent it with my resume. Um, that was my quantifiable numbers. They want proof. So we'll talk about all of those things and more. So sit back, relax, enjoy the show, and um, I'll catch you back in a minute. All right, Hannah, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know that yeah. this is what you do is resumes <laughs> and especially remote and focused on the tech world, I'm assuming. Um, yeah. But before I assume too much, how about you just kind of give me a quick rundown of who you are and, and what you're, you've been doing all these years? Yes. So I'm Hannah. I'm a recruiter. I've been a recruiter for almost three years now, which oh, wow. feels like not a lot of time, but also like a lot of time. 
uh, I've worked at an agency. So working with a bunch of different tech companies, uh, oh, wow. mostly in the New York City area. Yeah, which was awesome. And that was a really great place for me to start because I feel like I learned so much about so many different kinds of startups um, and like what different hiring managers look for and different companies look for. And that was awesome. And, um, and I focus on go to market roles, uh, mostly sales and customer success. In my current role, I do a lot of customer success hiring. Um, but in the past, I've done sales recruiting and then some engineering recruiting as well. How many resumes have you laid your eyes on? Oh my gosh. Um, a few thousand probably. I At least, say. right? When someone submits an application to a company, the first step is usually just a quick screen to see if you should even make it to the next round. There's generally many rounds. Right. I think that the resume is the most important in round one because it's like the only knowledge you have about the candidate. Um, yes. <clears throat> how long would you say you would spend on each resume that you look at as you're screening? And do you use any like technology that helps you? Yeah. So on average, I would say I probably spend 15 to 30 seconds looking at that's, a resume. That's a lot, honestly. Like Which is kind of a a lot i remember when i was in college i had a recruiter come into some meeting and said you know we look at resumes for five seconds and i think there are times industry is what it shares online is like six seconds yeah and a lot of times i do like i'll be honest i do quick yeah. glances especially if it's a role that i've worked on for a really long time and i know exactly what i'm looking for um i give in that buffer because i <laughs> will oftentimes um like click around, I go to people's LinkedIn's. So to see what's up there, I always recommend that people link their LinkedIn's in their job application. So it's very helpful, um, especially if it's a company I've never heard of before. It's so much easier to go into their LinkedIn, click on the link and see what the industry they're in and what the company does um, versus like having to kind of figure it out and having to Google it, which I'm sure a lot of recruiters don't have the time for. I try if just I think- won't do it, yeah. Yeah, and I try and I don't blame people too because there's definitely a lot of times where I am like, you know, it's a lot of work and I have 200 other applicants that I have to look mm -hmm. through. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, but there's also a lot of times where I do go the extra mile and look at people's LinkedIn's and try and see if I can make it work. Um, but I right now I just use Greenhouse as an applicant tracking system and then uh, LinkedIn to plug into that to kind of supplement some of the information that's on people's LinkedIn's or sorry, yeah. on people's resumes. I actually get a lot of naysayers about like having to have a LinkedIn and I tell people you don't have to, but I personally, just from my experience, it helps. It helps so much. And I've, I've definitely talked to people who haven't had a LinkedIn before. And I think yeah. maybe as a society we're going towards, like, it's really cool not to have social media. I think, um, LinkedIn is super cool to have coming from a recruiter. <laughs> it's it's just so much easier for me to get information about the company you work for. Right. I also, I think it adds a lot of credibility too for salespeople. Like there's a lot of selling that happens over LinkedIn. So if I'm looking yes. for like a really seasoned account executive position and this person doesn't have a, uh, a LinkedIn, like that's to me is a, a little off because I think there's so much networking that happens and so much mm -hmm. like selling that happens. You almost have to so, ask, well, where did you sell before if you didn't sell right. on LinkedIn, right? And coming from an agency background too, like that, <laughs> like I really didn't really talk to people that didn't have um, LinkedIn's. Also, you're kind of shutting yourself off to recruiters reaching out to you because that's how I do a lot of outreach. It's exclusively through LinkedIn for when I'm sourcing for maybe like a harder to fill role. So you're kind of like closing yourself off to some of those opportunities as well. I think a lot of people don't realize that you can make your profile to be open to where someone like Hannah see you. Even yeah. if she like, I don't know how it works on the back end, but mm -hmm. essentially searching for someone with a certain skill set, mm -hmm. and then boom, your profile pops up and then she can see what your salary range might be, uh, what your experience is, where you've worked and, and can say, just without you doing anything, I think I want to talk to this person. Yeah. No. Awesome. It's, it's such a game changer, especially like right now, the market is really hot and it's really competitive. So, you know, if yeah. you're even like slightly unhappy at your job and you want to put on open to new opportunities, your current company, your current employer cannot see that you're open to new opportunities as well. 
So you don't have to worry about, you know, your VP of sales being like, why, why are you open to new opportunities? They can't see that, but it's helpful just to have conversations, even if you're just a little unhappy because there's so many great job openings right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely, I guess, a, a, a buyer's market, we could call it. Yeah, just absolutely about, like, a buyer's yeah. market. Yeah, totally. For um, sure. When you're, when you're spending your six to 15 seconds on your screening a resume, yes. Where do your eyes go? Is it different per application or resume or is it generally, I look for these things first? Yeah, I look at uh, probably companies and then titles or yeah, maybe titles and companies, I'll say. Um, I usually go right to the experience portion. That's always first for me. So looking like where have they been before? What have their titles been? How long have they been there? Those are the biggest things. I think tenure is something we can talk about because I think right now with like the current situation that we're all in, tenure is a little bit subjective. I mean, it always is, but it's even now. Um, and then I'll look at skills that they have, what kind of tools have they used in the past um, and things like that. I don't really look at education that much. I'm of the belief that you don't need a college degree to be successful and you don't need a college degree Agreed. to be good at your job. So, I mean, obviously like, yeah, I want my doctor to go to college, but right. I mean, outside of some of those fields, like it's, it's not really necessary. And I'm very lucky that I, you know, now don't have to work within those parameters. I have been places in the past where I had, had to exclusively look at people with college degrees. Uh, so I don't necessarily look there. It's really just like experience is the biggest thing. And then skills, especially if you're hiring for a technical role and you need someone who knows JavaScript and TypeScript, I'm going to look there and make sure it's on someone's resume. Yeah. That, so the skills portion and, and that I've heard that randomly when I, when I research this, that, um, I think the top two I've heard is how long you've been at a company. And of course now you're right with the state of the world. Yeah. That is a little different, but it is still really important that the recruiter sees that you're capable of, of longevity of being yeah. somewhere and that it's not going to be immediate turnover because you're tough to get along with or whatever the case is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I look I'll, for tenure with in the years, you know, 2020 to now, I don't really worry that much about tenure. Um, a lot of times people too will put, you know, laid off due to COVID-19, which is, is helpful because I think it just gives a recruiter a little bit yeah. of context, but not to, not necessary. But before that, I do like to see that someone's been at a company for at least a year. Um, it, in tech, there is so much turnover and there's so much moving around. So I, I think ideally a year to 18 months at each company, but also things pop up and things happen. And even before COVID, people were getting laid off. Mm -hmm. So is, I think if there's a story that someone can tell and you know, a cover letter is a, a good place to, to tell that story or just briefly in the resume, you know, putting why they left a company after four or five months, that's right. helpful. Um, and just being ready. Finding like, those gaps. Yeah, I think and gaps happen, gaps are okay. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, people get sick, people have to take care of family, people have kids. Um, people just take a sabbatical. Which... There's a lot of people who want to convert from a non-remote, most likely non-tech uh, mm -hmm. environment to a remote environment. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that. I did that. Totally. Um, yeah. And Same. one of the things that I kind of preach, especially as you're talking about skills, is a lot of these companies, they're going to have to train you on the product or the service or whatever mm -hmm. it is that they have. Um, they don't want to have to train you on necessarily how to use some of the tools that are just a part of the job. Let's say the company communicates internally using Slack um, mm -hmm. and the customer service team communicates with customers using intercom. How mm -hmm. important would it be for you to be able to say, oh, this person knows intercom and Slack because there are plenty of training tools out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, how important is that? And would you suggest that they go out and and just and learn it, and talk the talk? Yeah, I think for someone transitioning into a purely remote role, I would try and do a couple of trainings. I, mm -hmm. I'm less worried about like Slack and Teams. 
um, more so in our common Zendesk. Look at a couple of demos, go on, try and find some videos to walk you through how to do it. And you know, if there's any certifications you can complete in some of those tools, that's really helpful. But um, also like being able to speak to that on a call too, and yes. just say like, hey, I, I know I haven't used it before, but I've done X, Y, Z to teach myself how to use it. I've done trainings, I've, you know, even if there isn't a certification on it, just being able to speak to, I took the initiative because I know I want to be in a remote workforce. What so does I that tell you about this. that applicant? Go get her. And that's the biggest thing with switching from an in-person to a remote job is it's really hard to teach someone to be a go-getter and to teach time management and to teach accountability. And those are things that are really hard to keep track of when you're in a remote world. You can't go over to someone's desk and say, hey, Billy, have you completed this? Have you done this? You can slack them, but right. it's, it's just harder to stay on top of people. So anything that you can speak to either in an interview or on your resume for um, like taking accountability, maybe it's an initiative at you know, your current in-person job that you decided, Hey, I don't like the way that we submit paperwork, even if it's just in the office. And I decided to revamp that. I decided to do X, Y, Z. Speaks volumes because well, again, like those skills are transferable and those are also skills you can't really teach. Right. Um, I wish I could teach time management and communication right. and accountability. That'd be great. It'd be awesome. But yeah, I think can't really I, be I like, I like to use the word go-getter. I, I tend to use the word Hustler, and that's not yeah. what I want to go for. So I, I think that go getter is a really fair way of saying that they want someone who is ambitious that can take yeah. take initiative. Yeah, because those are qualities you can't teach. And if you're can't teach. doing that to prove it, like you're proving yourself, right? Um, and that could be the factor that puts you in the place of someone who has that experience, but just kind of submitted their application and said, "See, I can do it. I've done it." And right. you're saying like. Exactly. I look, look at me. Yeah. Right. And it's, and it's hard and it takes a little bit more effort, but I think just the payoff is so yeah. much better. And then people also feel better about it, especially if you're switching into, um, maybe like an, I don't want to say entry level, but you're, you're switching to a job where they're hiring a lot of people or people who are maybe a little bit more green in their career, being able to show that you have a lot of accountability is huge. Cause mm -hmm. that's a really big fear that a lot of hiring managers have. It's like, how am I going to manage this person and teach this person like how to have a corporate job? Because that is, you have to learn how to have a corporate job. It's yeah. hard. <laughs> hard. Um, so yeah, I think anything you can say, like speak to the ability to take initiative and accountability, be a go-getter. So helpful. Done. Love Done. that. What would you say, in your opinion, <clears throat> is some resume no-nos? Do not do this. Do not pass go inconsistencies I think are like the biggest thing that you know like timelines are unclear job title is maybe not matching up to LinkedIn or um, maybe seems inflated and I know that people like to inflate their title because they think it's going to get them in, in front of someone um, ah. recruiters can usually see through that so I would not recommend inflating your title by making it like you know, director of mid-market sales when you're, you know, a senior when account executive. When you're literally a, an account executive, right. And also, it's really easy to go onto your company's LinkedIn page and see what other people's job titles are to really figure right. out what someone's doing. Right. That's, I think, like, one of the biggest mistakes that people make because then it's kind of like, well, you've already lied to me a little bit mm -hmm. uh, and you already haven't been truthful. Well, said uh, trust. Right. And so then there's like that, not that trust. And again, I totally get why people want to like puff up their chest a little bit and like seem like they're doing more than they are, but usually just backfires <laughs> because again, right. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't want to hire yeah. someone who just kind of fibbed from the gate. Right. Like if there's nothing wrong with whatever job title you have, you should be proud right. of it because you worked hard to get there. You've earned that title. You don't need to inflate it. Owning who you are and what you've done, that goes much farther than the fibbing. <laughs> uh, the formatting is not great, so it's not consistent. Um, I would say the, the bullets are definitely more helpful than the paragraph because it's really hard to read through. Yes. So I always recommend 
bulleting things out when you can. I also will say like that might be a bias that I have because that's how I read and that's also how I, I learn and when I take notes, I bullet things out. Uh, I, just think I think that's fair. Weird. Um Right. You can just look at it and say like, this is one skill, this is two skills versus right. just a blob of skills. And I'm sure it's when hard. you have seconds to review a resume, it's easy to skip over those that just feel really heavy. Exactly. It's kind of, especially if you know that you're applying for a job that has like a wider pool of candidates based on like what they're looking, the job's looking for, definitely like stay away from anything that's going to be hard to read because they're, you know, if a recruiter has 600 applications to go through, mm -hmm. that it's going to be tough. And like, you're probably like, it's just going to be too much effort for them to read. Another thing I will say is it's all of the descriptions are pretty vague. So, you know, six figure average contract value. That's what ACV stands for. Um, you know, consistently exceeded quota. Well, like, what was your quota? That right. gives me a good idea of what kind of sale you've worked on before. You know, if your quota is $50,000 for a year and I'm hiring for a role that the quota is going to be 2.5 million, probably not going to be a fit because you haven't, you know, right. you haven't had that experience before. So, but you would have to ask to even find that out in this case. Exactly. And then it's, you know, I, I'd rather just like, time. Could be wasted time, and it's also a waste of time for the candidate too, or they could have had an interview with another company that they're better suited for. So I think it's like it's kind of twofold there, where it's like wasting both people's times. Right. In the second job, big company number two, there's not a lot there. Like recognized by the company owner at the end. Well, like, for what? How were you recognized? <laughs> for what? Yeah. yeah. Like, did you go to um, like president's club? Did you get some sort of write up or? a mini promotion, something like that. Like be, you know, be honest, be upfront um, and give more information where you can. Most recent should go at the top for resumes. Uh, so yeah. most recent thing you've done and then uh, go down from there to previous companies. That's just standard for across resumes. And it's very confusing when someone flips it. So just make sure you're going most recent, think like most recent, most important down from there. And, um, but just looking at this one, there's three listed. It just goes back five years. Is five years kind of what you would suggest? So go back really as far as you think is relevant. I think it's totally up to the person. If you have less than six, seven years of experience, keep it to one page. So if you have to maybe skip like your first job out of college, you know, right. maybe take off those internships, whatever it may be, try to keep it to one page. And then from there, I mean, I th I've, I've seen resumes that have been quite long, you know, I think I once had an eight page resume. What? And that's where LinkedIn is so handy because you can just can link me to your LinkedIn and I can see what you've done. Oh, I love that. That like have a long resume, use LinkedIn. Use LinkedIn. It's so helpful. It's, uh, I, LinkedIn is probably my, my most used social media tool, which is so embarrassing to say out loud, but I it's, it a lot. it's addicting. It's so much, it, there's a lot of good stuff on LinkedIn, a lot of weird stuff, but a lot of good stuff. <laughs> as far as a recruiter though, it's not something that if you're like, oh, you didn't go back 10 years, forget it. It's no, not. yeah, no, nothing like that. No. Um, and I think a lot of times too, like if people have, I've seen this a lot and I actually kind of like it where people will give, you know, their most recent few jobs, good blurbs, you know, have information. And then the ones that aren't as relevant, they'll go ahead and say like, I was at XYZ company for this amount of time as this, I was at this company for this long and go through it and just have like a few bullets of other jobs that they were in, um, which is really helpful. So I can see the other companies that they've been at, but I don't, I'm not, having to read through all these blurbs on it. So I can go back right. and ask, like, how did you like working at that company? And I know that they were there, but they've acknowledged, yeah, like that was 20 years ago. So it might not be that relevant to this role. So that I really like. And I think that's a good, um, a good option for folks who have yeah. an extensive career history. Well, let's look at the, let's look at the, the good one and kind of, yeah. since it's fresh, let's make some comparisons. Yeah. So headers, I don't, 
it doesn't really matter. I don't have a header on my personal resume, but I think if you want to say like senior account executive so that folks know, that's cool. Everything's kind of the same there, contact information, phone number, where they live. Also, I think being in a remote world, you, I care less about where people are located now. Um, if you're- I've always trying, wondered if we will yeah. eventually trade location for time zone. That's interesting. That's a good thought. Cause especially for some roles where like you're in support or- Right, it a matters. Role where, like, it matters, it totally matters. And that's something too, like I've hired for different time zones and that can be tricky. And it's more applicable like if you're applying to a company where like it's a hybrid yeah like, they probably want to know where you are um and i don't think you necessarily need to put like your full address if you don't want to mm -hmm. especially if you're crammed for space on your experience <laughs> and you're like whoa like i like take it out i had to do that and now i just like put in the state that i the city and state that i live in because i had other things that i wanted to use yeah um to to like better utilize the space that I have on my resume. Putting the links in a resume is okay, cool. especially cool if thing. you have a lot of good information, I'm sure, in your LinkedIn. Yes. Oh yeah. And that's like, I think, I think of LinkedIn as just like another resume. And I, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I probably need to update my LinkedIn, like add more information to make it more of a resume. But I think people should rely on LinkedIn, but also have a good resume, have a pretty looking resume, but. I've made several professional connections through LinkedIn, just I, oh being yeah. alive on there, right? Like it's fantastic. And it's such a great way to network and especially with tech, like the tech community is really, it is large, but it's so small. Um, especially like I'm in Boston, Massachusetts, like it's everyone knows each other for the most part within tech here. Um, oh, that's cool. So yeah, so like, you know, connect with people. It might be a job down the line. It might be they have a referral for you. They might want to come work for you down the line. Um, so I think people should lean in a little bit more to making LinkedIn connections. You don't have to go and post things if that's not your jam, because it's, it's not my jam, but uh, I just, I'm not a writer. I'm not one with words like that. So I don't, uh, no one wants You're to You're a reader, have to say. a resume I'm a, reader. Yeah, I'm a resume reader. I'm not a writer. Um, we all we all got our things. <laughs> we all have our things. Um, and oh, one thing I wanted to add to for the poor resume, I think this is a sentiment shared by a lot of recruiters. You don't necessarily have to put a picture of yourself on your your resume. Um, so I usually think that there's a better use of space, space. on the resume, than and then comes down to a spacing <laughs> thing. Exactly right. Yeah, and if that's I, fair. As an alternative. If you want people to see your face, just put your picture on LinkedIn as your profile picture, and then and then link your LinkedIn, and boom, I can see what I can see Done. your handsome face or your handsome mm -hmm. face, whatever. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, yeah. So just because I think you want to, especially if you have a lot of experience, you really want to like that maximize space is important. Mm -hmm. the space. Um, so that's just my two cents there. But, and if, but if you're happy and you love having your picture on your resume, who am I to put tell you not there. to do that? Yeah. Put it on there. So um, on this resume, then like I see. The yeah. company's listed in order, which is, mm -hmm. you know, from most recent to mm -hmm. mm, least recent. I'm not sure how to least say Least recent, it. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Farthest away. They're, right, whatever. They're bulleted whatever. out, very mm -hmm. clear. Um, you know, this this is one thing I've done. This is another thing I'm experienced with. Super clear, plus the leveling up of their titles makes sense to go from yep. A business development representative, which is typically entry level sales, mm -hmm. um, then up to a standard like salesperson, account manager, account executive, um, mm -hmm. and kind of stayed there. It looks like maybe uh, potentially could it be a, a lead position or a um, yes. what's, the, what's the other one? Um, manager, team lead. Yeah, or the, you said it earlier, something account executive. Enterprise? Senior? Yeah, could be. Senior, okay. that's what I was looking Senior? for. Oh, yep. yep. Senior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what else about this resume um, is like super important to for others to mimic or even just use as inspiration? Yeah, I would say the hardcore, like quantifiable skills. So like, I, you know, this was my percentage to my quota. I'm showing you like, I'm a really good performer and that I'm being really honest and upfront with how I did in my performance. It's also helpful in knowing, um, you know, what kind of 
sale you want to be part of. I think a lot of sales folks have a sales process that they really like or a, right. like they really like working with enterprise clients or mid-market or small, you know, whatever it may be. So it's showing like, this is my success. And it's also showing you my average contract value. This is the type of sales I've been working on just right. to give you a heads up. But average contract value, not super necessary. I would say the biggest thing would be like putting your quota attainment on there. That's really helpful. Right. It gives the recruiter a really good look at like, oh, they have been successful in the role before, um, you know, ranked in the top 5% out of 195, 195 representatives. Like, yeah, you outperformed a lot of your team. That's awesome. It also says like, okay, so not everyone was hitting quota um, or, you know, not everyone was as successful as you were. So it is setting you like, oh, you are a go-getter. Right. Um, so, and then another thing here, like, you know, resulted in you know consistently secured new accounts 30 percent increase in revenue year over year mm -hmm. you know just a couple of other things that you've done um going to the second company again you have like your quota average contract value you were 2018 president's club winner that's awesome that's really hard to do um you assisted the vp of sales in a new demo process which increased revenue by 25 percent you're a go-getter you saw this process that wasn't working and you worked with the VP of sales to fix it. Now, I don't know how much work you were doing. I don't know if you sat on one little committee and had one meeting about it, but that still shows me like you took right. initiative to work on a process. But when, um, let's say that, cause this person, this fake, who is this? Let's see, Jane Smith. Uh, Jane Smith. Yeah. <laughs> she, uh, she seems to have had some like very almost like standard techie type of experience. What if someone yeah. is going for not necessarily even an entry level position, maybe they've spent years in tractor supply sales uh, where mm -hmm. they had to hit quota and, or maybe they sold cars, um, mm -hmm. but sales is what they love. Uh, and they put yeah. those numbers on here. Would it deter you at all from saying like, I think they could do this or what other steps would you like to see on their resume to make that transition for it to be enough? Yeah, that transition is tough and it's one that I've in the past helped people make. I think you have to be okay with taking a step back to take a few steps It's hard forward. to say that, but it's true. And it's hard. And I, I sometimes will say like, it's a step to the side. It's tech sales and um, like, the sale of a car or a tractor, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, they're very different. And the process is the selling process is very different. And I always say like to set yourself up for success, you're going to have to take this step to the side or this, this slight pivot, which totally, I get it. Like it can crush your ego and it can feel like, but I've done this for so long. They're just so different. And for someone to be set up for success, a lot of time they do have to kind of like go back to basics, take a, a, a more junior role. I don't want to say like entry yeah. role, but more junior to set themselves up for success because if they get thrown into an account executive role where they have a five hundred thousand dollar quota and they're trying to sell software that they've and never suddenly sold they're before, just not equipped for it. It's they're not equipped it's a blow. and it's it's a blow and it's like then they're maybe not hitting quota and then they feel really bad and now they're not with that company at all because they couldn't hack it versus like swallowing your pride and going after a more uh, a more junior role. And then knowing, you know, in a year, year and yeah. a half, I can be an account executive and I can be like the actual sales. Gaps. Yeah, exactly. It's just a learn, it's a steep, steep learning curve. And I get it like sales is sales, but within you there's know, making difference. that transition, it, there's a difference and it's hard. Well, and I, I can truly say, I get it. I'm, yeah. I'm 37 years old. Um, yeah. I've had a life and most of it was spent in regular on-site jobs. Um, yeah. I even owned my own business for a little while. When I decided to come back into the remote world, um, I started in a call center. Yeah. Um, at, and at that time I was 34, I think. Um, yeah. And was it easy? No, because I, in my pride, I was like, Shannon, right. You're supposed to be a little bit farther than this by now, but I did it because this is what I wanted. And listen, I worked my booty off and look at you now. I know, right. Made it to revenue enablement and like, I'm not 
junior anymore, like no. where I was. No. And it, 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 I, it, I experienced a lot of growth. Um, and so I can say like, I know that's hard, but I, yeah. if this is what you want, the payoff is <laughs> worth it. Right. And I think it also ties back in this like a whole other conversation of like where people think that they should be. I took time off after college to work in restaurants and work retail and work customer support. Best thing I ever did. But then all of a sudden I was like, I'm in the same job as people that graduated with my younger brother from college. And it's that was sometimes as a bruise to my ego. But then I look at where I am now and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so happy that was my path. And I look at some of my friends and I'm like, oh, I was able to like boost myself to now I'm at the level that they were at, even though I had that you know, I was a few steps behind them. Mm-hmm. So you will be where you will meant to be. You're where you're meant to be as long as you like make it happen, but don't feel like you're supposed to be anywhere because you gotta get that thought out of your head. Gotta get that yeah. out of your head. Comparison is a thief of joy. Yes. I Preach. firmly believe I love that. that I one. firmly believe that. So it's true. If you really want something and it means you have to take a step back, then, you, then you'll do it. But if you don't really yeah. want it and you don't want to take that step back, then that's fine. But then keep growing on the on-site side. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Well, if I I know we're about out of time, the main thing that I want to, I guess, end with is if you had, if, if someone watching this forgot everything else you said and was only able to leave with a few tips to make their resume Mm -hmm. ready for a remote recruiter, what would you say? I would say put all of, put quantifiable skills. So any kind of metric, any number you can speak to. Us recruiters love numbers. Um, again, not the end all be all if you're in a role that like doesn't have numbers, but right. any, you know, um, just as a little insert, I wasn't in um, sales. I had no mm-hmm. quantifiable yeah. numbers. I took screenshots of reviews that were written yes. about me yeah. and put mm-hmm. them in an email and said, I just want to show you this. Yeah. And That's it was great just some too. sort of proof. Always also take screenshots of, you know, your sales performance so that you know it. Like take screenshots of reviews. That's what I've actually done too. And as an agency recruiter, I also had metrics, but I took screenshots of reviews that people had left me. Um, because that's also really great. Like, oh, you've had great at people skills. Like that's huge. Um, I'd also say, you know, in the day, in the same age of tech, you don't have to freestyle a resume. Go and get a template somewhere, make sure you know, like Indeed does a lot of stuff like that. Um, I like Canva. Canva is beautiful. I love, maybe I'll do my next resume on Canva. I did my husband's on Canva. <laughs> did you really? Yeah. <laughs> Showed it. Well, you know, he sat here with me, but great. I was the culprit. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. That was a good one. I've seen it. Um, so yeah, like you do not have to freestyle a resume if you're ever unsure, just Google. Like if I want to be in customer success customer success resumes and examples will pop up. That's what I did with recruiting. Even when I was a recruiter, I did that, or I guess I am still a recruiter, but in my last job search, I was like recruiter resumes, just look them up. You don't, again, you don't have to freestyle anymore. Um, And it also, I think there's just formatting is huge to help recruiters eyes find the, the good stuff about you. So I would say those are probably the biggest things. I love that. No, this has been incredibly helpful and fun. I enjoyed this conversation. This was so much fun. Good. Well, you're welcome to join me anytime. Um, I am positive we'll have some questions and someone will want to see more. So maybe we can connect again and chit chat. um, Absolutely. But in the between times, so much knowledge in here that I need to. Oh, I know. I'm trying to get it all out. Share it with everybody. My brain is just so big and I have so much knowledge in it. (laughs) Let's well, that's what I'm here for. Exactly. Thank we'll you, get it Shannon. Out of there. Yes, thank you, Hannah. All right, I appreciate you. Bye. Thank you. How you no. feel? Good. Feel like you got some information out of that? Good. This is from Hannah's perspective. This is her personal opinion. But listen, she's been doing this for a long time and she's worked with a lot of other people in this space, which means other people most likely share at least some of her feelings and, and opinions here. The number one thing I think that you should walk away from this video with is understanding what you're missing, right? I think we all need to be very honest with ourselves. I think we need to step back and look at what are we really, really good at and what would this company say no for? 
And if I were applying to a company where I would be working on a tool that I was not accustomed to, I know that that would be my gap. That would be what I wasn't good at. So I would figure out how to learn that tool before I ever spoke to a person in that company. They would take that interview with me and I would be like, oh, Intercom? Absolutely. Actually, just recently, I got certified in Intercom and I'm very skilled. Um, they want to know that you are willing to get it, to go for it, to do the extra work and go the extra mile. I think that's it's huge. Consolidate, be smart with how you put in the information. I, I mean, I, I think Hannah hit all the big points. Please be sure to follow me on TikTok. Be sure to follow me on YouTube here. I would love a like and a, a subscribe. Uh, that'd be super amazing. I just hit a thousand at the posting of this video. I'm pretty mind blown. Um, and just hit a hundred thousand on TikTok. So um, I'm so grateful for this beautiful community that we've established and, and the wonderful motivation that everyone is giving each other to succeed, to be the best version of themselves and to get the job that they want. You know I'm available if you need me. I love you and I'm grateful for you. Have an awesome day.